Hi, everyone. My name is Darius, and today I will talk about plugin architecture. And in iOS context, it might sound a bit strange, uh, but I assure you that in the end, it all makes sense. So uh, I will talk a bit about history, then what is the plugin architecture, and why you might consider using it. And then I will talk a bit about open close principle and show some examples in UIKit. And by the way, how many of you still using UIKit as primary uh, source for building the UI? Yeah, still quite some. So uh, about history. So plugin architecture is also known as uh, micro kernel architecture. And when you hear word micro kernel, you might think like Unix, Linux, something around those lines. And actually, uh, Unix was the kind of in the early beginning the first attempts to kind of extract things into components. So they have small module utilities that you can pipe together. And later on, there was two decades of uh, component-based software engineering to attempt to kind of make different components and composition things together. And then in 1997, Internet Explorer was the first major browser that had extensions to add additional functionality. And in 2001, Eclipse was the EDE that was kind of from ground up built around plugin architecture because uh, Eclipse as a baseline is just like text editor and all the functionalities added via plugins. Yes, so why you might consider using plugin architecture? So in app, we sometimes have like screens that are pretty complex. So those like product pages, uh, checkout, home page that has lots of things going on in one place. And usually what we're trying to do, we're just trying to kind of use those MVVM, VAP, whatever other patterns to kind of split between uh, presentation logic and uh, business logic. And if it's uh, pretty uh, small functionality, it's usually enough. But when it goes larger, the business logic part also grows larger. And it might be not enough. And you might think about other ways how to split it up in, into smaller pieces. And, and their plugin architecture comes into play. So, uh, it's pretty important to kind of remind ourselves about open close principle, and especially in plugin architecture, it kind of means that uh, you have those plugins, the new functionality or additional one that you want to kind of uh, add, and by adding it, it means that you don't change anything that's other. So it's kind of good in the sense that you kind of don't need to test things that was there before because you don't change anything. Of course, you should test, uh, but it's. Uh, the main principle is that you just add new things without changing what is there. Yeah, so going to plugin architecture itself, so you have two main parts in plugin architecture. You have that core system, and then you have plugins that uh, integrates in it, and it has some benefits. So for example, uh, it makes it easy to add new functionality via plugins, and because plugins is kind of functionality in the box, you can develop it and test it uh, separately. But also, it has some trade-offs. And for example, that core system you need to design up front because it's kind of integration point when all those plugins kind of integrate. So if you want to kind of change it later on, it might be pretty expensive because then you kind of break the contracts, how you, you kind of manage those plugins and so on. And also, those cons implies that the core system should be pretty small. So in that Eclipse example I mentioned before, you should aim to make uh, that core system as small as possible, because all those changes that you want to make there later on will kind of hit you hard. And in real life, it's usually a bit more complicated than just like simple drawing use plugins, assemble it, and so on. So it's more things going on there. So here's an example of demo checkout screen. 
which is somewhat complex. So we have a list of items. You have total price, you have a field for promo code, you have uh, a button that choosing payment method, and you have pay. So basically we have like these five pieces that kind of do separate things. And uh, as kind of first step, what you usually trying to do is to kind of disassemble it, to create like uh, using some pattern, separate like presentation logic and business logic via some MVM, VAP, or uh, any other pattern. And you kind of split it to different views for different sections, and then you have corresponding view model or like interactor or like whatever other unit kind of deals with the logic. And then it might not be enough, and you might think about kind of uh, kind of stepping it up a bit, and not only kind of separating the views a bit, but also bundling that logic together with the view. With the view. So basically, uh, you might consider having like child view controllers because then you have like presentation and business logic in the same place, and then you can use like in this case for like MVVM uh, things to compose it together. And what child view controllers also does that you have access to navigation uh, stack. So basically, you can also navigate deeper. So for example, you have those items, you can click on those, and from that items view controller, you can kind of show the item page and, and so on. So you have also the navigation kind of embedded. And uh, you can also step a bit more and have plugins that wraps those view controllers up. And what it does is basically uh, makes in that open closed principle that uh, in, in that previous example, the view controllers are not necessarily uh, uh, not changing the code when you're adding new view controller. You, you probably, to add new view controller, you need to have some enum of, of the list, what is there, some other things. So not changing, not creating like new view controller, just like it plugs in. You're just changing different places around your code base to kind of achieve that. And with plugins to kind of bundle that. And, and the main idea is that you don't need to change the, the other stuff that was there before. So I'll explain a bit how we can achieve that. So, so here's the example how that kind of breakdown could look. So we have like, for example, check out your controller, we have some kind of service that get, uh, does the get response to get the content of that screen, and you have uh, the post on pawn for doing the payment, and you click the pay button. And then you have that core system that basically uh, coordinates the plugin logic. So each element you create as plugin, and uh, you need like a banner. Just create a banner plugin, just put it in, and then it works. So, uh, ideally, you won't change anything, but you need to change something. So, uh, in this case, you have some kind of registry to make uh, awareness of existence of those plugins, uh, with those engines. And basically, what this registry does, it makes like single place that you need to change in order to kind of add the plugin. So, you, if you want a banner, just add new entry with identifier like banner and bl banner plugin factory. And then basically, in ideal case, it should be only place that you need to change. And then for additional like banner or so, you will just create new code and you won't touch at all the old code. So basically, here are identifiers and the factories that builds it. So it kind of sounds simple and almost too good to be true, like you don't ch change anything that was before, you just add the entry and register, just like magically appears. So there is a catch to it. So the, the first problem that you probably will face is that uh, response itself, because you want like, for example, add a banner and check out or whatever. And you might find out that you not only need to change the registry, but you need also to update the 
response decodable struct to have the data of the banner, so you kind of need to change two places. And you not necessarily want that. So one way to kind of solve it is just to split uh, the data out of that response to separate requests. So then you're kind of delegating the, the, getting the data to the plugins itself. They do their own request, uh, then draw CI and so on. Uh, and it might be good in some cases, but not all. You, we modelists usually deal with like single response and then we need to figure out how to kind of break it down. So another way to kind of do it is uh, to do some uh, custom decoding. So uh, it's a bit sad that there is no proper way to do it with decodable. Say like I want some portion of the response to be kind of decodable or some like as a raw. So there is not a very straightforward way to do it. So what usually you need to do is just go the old fashioned way with JSON serialization. So you have like uh, response data, you decode it to JSON dictionary, then you basically pick the things out of it that uh, belongs to separate kind of plugin uh, or component, and then you basically uh, turn it back to the data, and then you have like array of like identifier like items and then the data that basically behind the scenes is that uh, JSON of the items list. And that way you kind of repackaging it in more like primitive types. And that way you kind of uh, have some benefits that for example, if uh, backend uh, data changes for some like a banner, which is not for example relevant, and uh, there was required fields and right now did not return. In usual case, uh, your all entire response will just throw and you show nothing, but when you're kind of repackaging it and delegating the responsibility deeper to the plugin itself, you basically can deal with those kind of error tolerance that you can, uh, don't matter that much if some data kind of changes or breaks things because then individual plugin can deal with that later on. So uh, in that uh, registry, there was like identifier in that plugin factory. So what that plugin factory kind of does, and I was talk talking right now about that uh, second example, when you have like disassembled the response, repackaged it. So, so that core system just checks like, there's this kind of entry items in the registry with this factory, and I have this uh, items with data in the response, so I can use some detail object or just linear array, it maps it, and then calls the factory with the data to kind of do the magic. And behind the scenes is nothing uh, magical. This is the example of like uh, JSON, so I have like plugins array in the JSON, we have some identifier like full, and then you have the content. So basically when you're repackaging it, you get that identifier full and that uh, content JSON just like converted back to the data. And then plugin itself kind of decodes it. It can throw, but then you make a decision in the core system, do I want to kind of fail if any factories fail? Or I say like, ah, oh, like if some factories fail, I don't care. I still draw those that kind of succeed. So in that case, like, if you messed up with coupon code uh, data or something, you can still show the rest and so on. So you have a bit better like error tolerance. And let's back to this slide a bit. So basically you just uh, have checkout view controller, you call that service, you get that uh, content JSON, then you basically do abracadabra and repackaging it that is basically more close to those primitive types and then you, you don't depend on it. So basically you add just new items that JSON response, but at the point of checkout your controller, you don't know what is there and you don't need to explicitly decode it, you just delegate it to plugins. So you just add new entry of the new plugin in the registry and the factories kind of do the decoding for its own part there. Yeah, so it sounds like salt, yes? 
And it kind of is for some cases. So for example, if you have product page, then those kind of pieces in the product page don't really uh, do much uh, communication back. It's basically just kind of displaying things. And then if there is some section of it that is uh, failed to decode, it's kind of fine, kind of drawing it. And, and uh, for those cases like product pages, uh, home pages, and so on, it's kind of fine. It probably is enough. But the problem arises when you need to have a communication between those different elements, like in, in checkout example or some other that uh, either uh, core system needs to get something out there, like do some kind of validation, or those elements itself needs to kind of communicate between each other. So this is the code snippet of uh, that uh, core system for checkout. So we have layout, which basically just returns the uh, those view controllers that kind of embedded in the individual plugin. And we have like two things that needs communication. So kind of one is refresh. So coupon code plugin uh, in this case says that uh, you enter coupon code and you kind of need to recalculate on the back end the pricing. So kind of need to communicate up that, oh, you need to kind of refresh everything. And other thing is kind of when you click pay, you need to kind of validate and communicate that between those elements. So let's start with validation. So with validation, we have like validatable protocol that has this validate function that throws the output. In our case, we need kind of two things to output out from the plugins. So it's total amount to so know how much you pay, and then payment method how you're going to pay. And uh, you should remember to use like interface segregation principle and not just put the validation uh, on all of those plugins because we, most of them don't need it. So uh, you can put it only for total price plugin and payment method plugin because only uh, these kind of care that validation happens. And then basically in core system, you just like filtered out only plugins that comply to that protocol, and then you do call the validate on those if, the th if they're throwing error. Because the plugin itself kind of throws, it can, uh, because it's also drawing its own kind of view and view controller, so it can also show that there's an error and so on, and uh, throwing if some data is missing, like payment methods not selected, and, and so, and then uh, handle its own UI, and then you kind of propagate error back to kind of check out uh, screen, and then it can do nothing because individual kind of uh, plugin deals with it, or it can additionally show errors, saying like, "Oh, you need to fill some data," and then individual plugin shows like what data is kind of missing. Yes, so let's talk about communication, which is kind of more complicated thing when you need some communication between those elements. So we kind of can do it like in similar fashion to create event publishing protocol and event consuming protocol, then attach those to those plugins that actually need to publish something or need to kind of consume something. So in our case, it's only coupon code that actually uh, publishes that refresh, because when you're entering coupon code, you need to kind of send it to the backend, recalculate, validate it, and, and so on. You can do in plugin itself the request say like if the coupon is valid, but still price calculation happens for entire checkout and so on. Uh, and then you should remember in this case that um, the number of events will be a problem. So the smaller amount of those you have, the better. Uh, and in that original uh, screenshot that I showed, it was like pay button in the bottom was not kind of change the plugin, and because uh, if you do pay as plugin, you then have way more communication because each plugin needs to say, oh, I know, there's price change, there is the payment method selected, and instead of just like single refresh, you have all kinds of communication happening between those elements. So it's, it's also kind of decision when you're designing that core system, how those elements, when 
will be interacting with each other and what you kind of need. And if you kind of designed wrongly, it might uh, be pretty painful to kind of deal with it later on. So in this case, like keeping out the pay logic outside of plugins make it simpler because uh, then all, only thing that during the validation plugin needs to just uh, communicate it out. And then payment is done like uh, outside that uh, core system. So in that core system, you can do simple binding between those plugins to basically do the similar validation. We just filter out those plugins that publishing, setting out the closure uh, that handles that publish event, and then handling it, basically notifying each of the plugins that consumes it. And in our case, it's nothing that consumes that refresh. It's only a core system itself that kind of listens to it and just puts out. But this logic kind of makes it uh, possible for other kind of type of communication if it's kind of needed in very kind of primitive example. Though you need to be a bit more careful not to create a cycle here because uh, it can easily fall into that. And to summarize it, uh, so plugin architecture uh, can modularize complex screens and allow it to make the changes and add new functionality without changing any other code that was before there. Though you need to co think quite extensively about the core system and what it does and how it will behave and what kind of future changes you might uh, need to implement because it might backfire, so we need to make it small. In this example, it was like, I think, only 100 lines of code, and you see like majority of it, so it was basically call, like calling the validation on each plugins and doing that binding, so it was not doing the, much of it, it's just like a glue that put those plugins together, and uh, you need to kind of consider trade-offs, because maybe just child controllers is enough for those like separate VP cycles or MVVM and so on. And communication is the pain. And if you have simple communication, I guess it's fine, but if you have, if you have more things going on, so probably you need to kind of reconsider how you do that, those things. And you should remember those kind of solid principles, especially open closed one, because ideally we want our system to, to be kind of not changing when we add things and more even outside of like plugins context, we can achieve that the better. And also with interface segregation that we don't want to kind of just put lot, like, lots of things in single protocols that we should have just empty implementation for things. So you hear about like plugin architecture is one of the ways to kind of modularize complex screens. Uh, it's not only the way, and you might not need it, but uh, it, it can help you also. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Darius, for your presentation. Uh, my first question will be about the routing. How do you fit the routing in all of this plugging architecture? It will, will it be a plugging too? Uh, it's hard to say. Like it's usually just enough. Like if you have child uh, controller, because you have the access to kind of navigation stack, you just do it from there. Because overall, like navigation and routing between like different things is not solved yet. So there are, like coordinators, flow controls, like you name it, routers that people try to kind of solve it and kind of not yet solve problem. <laughs> so it, it depends on the project needs and in most of the cases. Um, there's, there's a lot of people in, uh, in the audience who say, why don't you use Swift UI? Why do you have to use UI view controller? Why not UI view? It, it feels to me that the, your presentation was try not to think about it that way. It's not about the views themselves, about how you architect architecture your application. And then you can even maybe mix and match if you need to. Yeah, you know, it, it depends on the context. Like, SwiftUI is kind of great, but when you have, like, huge 
code base. You don't want to kind of go and just refactor things to SwiftUI just because you can, because you have other problems that you need to solve. And in Minto, we also have like a project that's running like for many years. There are lots of things. And especially in the bigger the project is, you don't want to have like, here's like one way, here's another way, and then like mix of different things. Uh, but definitely, like at some point, we will be switching. And also, like we need to kind of support older iOS versions. So because SwiftUI in like early stages was not that great, and like have some pitfalls. All right, thanks. And Darius, what would you say to people who like to modularize their application, like trying to build Swift packages and uh, to trying to respect the open close principle? Uh, what would you say to them if they say, like, do we really need this plugin architecture because we already are like, trying to spling out our you know service, not using a call system and so on? Yeah, so like plugin architecture is just like a fancy kind of name, but I guess we more or less doing like similar things already. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that open close principle that when you kind of need to add new functionality, you have a task to add new things. And when you kind of doing that and seeing that you need to change like 10 different places, so probably you need to kind of reconsider how you to improve that, that next time you go and change like instead of kind of 10 pl different places, like one or two. Because the more things you change, the probability that something breaks is bigger because if like like changing one place or two places, like okay, like one or two places can break, but if you're changing like ten, so there's like probably ten things that you're kind of touching and, and could break. Yeah. So at least I think like around like that. Because it's also like just main principle is just like you have plugin, you don't change uh, need to change anything else. And if you can achieve that in many different ways. Thank you. Last Can I ask my question? Last question. <laughs> so you were talking about communication being an issue because to me, when I think plugins, I think like uh, Final Cut Pro plugins, I think Quark Express plugins, like right, like small units of code that you load in an already running application, and so that's where the core system has to be well designed so that you know it doesn't break or does something you don't want to, right? Um, it's more a speculative kind of question. Like, do you, do you think like this? dynamic nature of plugins is going to be used or useful uh, uh, because right now it's for this st static architecture. You compile it and it works and it helps you with the development phase. But do you imagine somewhere where you could uh, optionally load some plugins but not others and have more of a dynamic kind of thing? Uh, Probably it's hard to say because uh, already you, you, there are attempts, but small for the games that you can load like different levels kind of separately. Yeah. So it might be that in future more in the apps we have this that we want to have some functionality kind of separate in a form like plugin, whatever like you name it like module that you kind of load separate and just like put it in when the app is running. Like games is a good example because you have like different levels that you kind of loading on the fly. So I would assume that it will go to that direction more and more because the apps are kind of growing and uh, like you don't, because they do more, like devices do more. So at some point it will be just ridiculous to download like half a gigabyte of the app that you need to do kind of single payment. Just, well, because it has like 20 <laughs> other things that you don't use. All right, thank you. Thank you.